So we have been on a journey together uh, through the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, it has been rich with an understanding of how God has created a world for us that though broken, he is drawing us to a greater understanding of the world that he is going to restore. And so the kingdom of God and the Sermon on the Mount is his teaching us about what the value system of that kingdom looks like and how different it is than the world in which we live. A world that's filled with hatred and brokenness and war and crime and poverty and racism and pride. And, and Jesus wants us to live with a value system that's different, that there is love and forgiveness and justice and, and humility. And so we walked through that in chapter 5 and 6 and 7 of the Sermon on the Mount. And then we came to chapter 8, and Jesus began to do miracles and reaching out to people who were different, the Gentiles, the, the lepers, uh, the Roman centurion. And so as we began to see Jesus perform those miracles, we began to have an understanding of what this kingdom will look like. And uh, in, in my reading, I came across um, some words by uh, a German theologian, and he said this, which I think is interesting about the miracles that Jesus was doing. He says, when Jesus expels demons and heals the sick, he is driving out of creations the powers of destruction and is healing and restoring created beings who are hurt and who are sick. The Lordship of God, to which the healings witness, restores creation to health. Jesus' healings are not supernatural miracles in a natural world. They are the only truly natural thing in the world that is broken, demonized, and wounded. So in a sense, what Jesus is doing is he's showing us what is the hope of each and every one of us as the kingdom of God is demonstrated and ultimately the restoration of the earth and that which lives on the earth becomes our experience. So as Matthew continues to tell these stories, um, you know, remember that chapters are not what Matthew wrote. We inserted them later on. So Matthew began to tell a bunch of stories about how Jesus was demonstrating the kingdom of God and people's lives were being touched. And the reality of that is what we're going to see and how evil continues to try to prevent that from happening. And so I want you to, uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 8 um, and look at some of these stories. And, and they don't really at first glance look like they even fit together, but they really fit together as we come to understand what God is trying to teach us here. And so in Matthew chapter 8 and beginning in verse 23, let me pray first and then we'll read this. Father, um, we just want to continue to pursue you and recognize that the way that you work in our heart and in our life is through the life of Jesus in us and through the word of God that gives us a revelation of what that life looks like and how God wants us to live. So give us ears to hear as we walk through this this morning. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So notice Matthew 8, verse 23. Um, it says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Then suddenly a storm came up on the lake, and this is talking about the, what we know the Sea of Galilee, which is really a lake, uh, maybe 15 miles, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, you of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men, these are the disciples, were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So when we think about Matthew, the author, we have to be asking ourselves the question, why would he tell us his story? 
And what does this story mean for us and for the disciples for that matter? And when we recognize this story, I think it's important for us to to sort of look back on the fact that Matthew is writing to Jewish people. And these disciples who are Jews had an inclination that they completely forgot. Because if we go back to the story of Israel from the beginning, as it is true of us, if you've been in America and you've been in around Christianity, you know that one of the greatest days, if you will, on the Christian calendar is the day that we call Easter. And the reason it's so important is because resurrection took place on that, and that resurrection represented to us Jesus' overcoming of evil, Jesus' overcoming of sin, Jesus' giving us the Holy Spirit, Jesus offering us forgiveness. There's probably no greater day than that day, and we celebrate it year after year after year. So even if you are not a follower of Jesus, you know what Easter Sunday is all about. Not unlike these Jews who, when they had a special day, that day was the Passover, right? The Passover represented, and you'll read it all throughout the Old Testament, even as the poets write about it in Psalms and the prophets. They write about this day. And you know the day where the, the Moses had heard from God, and Moses went to Pharaoh, and he said ten times, Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh kept saying, no, no, no. And then all of a sudden, God said, there is this day. I want you to take the lamb of the of the of the blood of the lamb, and I want you to put it on your doorpost, right? And I'm going to send the angel of death. Then that angel of death is going to pass over Egypt, and all the firstborn of the Egyptians will die. Because Pharaoh, who is the epitome of evil, will not let my people go. And they battled over it, and there were miracles and counterfeits. Then ultimately this day takes place. And Israel, led by Moses, begins to be leaving Egypt because Pharaoh had enough. But they get to the edge of a sea, right? They're leaving, and they come to this place called the Red Sea, and they notice that Egypt and Pharaoh and all of the army of Pharaoh is coming after them, and they're standing by this sea, and they're petrified now. And God says to Moses, he says, Stand still and watch the power of God. And God rebukes the sea. You know the story. He rebukes the sea and it parts. And Israel walks through the dry land. And they continue to go through the dry land. And as they cross over to the other side, and the army of Egypt follows them, God closes that sea on Pharaoh's army, and they die. And that story was a story for thousands of years that was told to the Israelites. Every Jewish boy, every Jewish girl would hear that story once a year, that Passover story of how God delivered his people. And that deliverance became sort of a a cornerstone for the understanding of what God would do with his people, that he could do that and he would bring restoration to all of them. Matter of fact, if we were to look a little bit farther and just recognize these things, I want you to see this Exodus story, chapter 14, verses 10 and on. It goes, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord, They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Look at verse 13. It says, Moses answered the people, do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today will never, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Verse 15, then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea and be on dry ground. Do you remember Charlton Heston? 
I mean, it was epic. And here are the Israelites, all the men and the women and children, because God rebuked the sea. And the poets and the psalmist picked up on this, and we see it all throughout Psalm 106. He says here, it is a reminder to Israel of what God could do. Psalm 106, verse 6, we have sinned even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong and acted wickedly. When our ancestors were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Yet he saved them for their namesake to make his mighty power known. Listen to it. Verse 9, he rebuked the Red Sea, and it dried up. He led them through the depths as through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe, from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. So the poets retell the story over and over again. Psalm 69, I just want you to see how this was a reoccurring theme. Verse 1, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. It goes on in Psalm 69, verse 14. Rescue me from the mire. Do not let me sink. Deliver me from those who hate me, from the deep waters. Do not let the flood waters engulf me or the depths swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. The poet is drowning. He's overwhelmed. It doesn't tell us what it is by his enemies, by, by hatred, by sin, by evil. But he cries out to God, the God who rebukes the sea, the very same sea that the poet is using as a metaphor for being overwhelmed with evil and sickness. I mean, he does it again, Psalm 88, Psalm 89, it says, who's like you, verse 8, Lord God Almighty, you, Lord, are mighty, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea when it waves mount up, you still them. So over and over again, we, we recognize that this story, this Passover story, the psalmist sang about it, the prophets sang about it was a recognition that though life might be overwhelming, God rebukes the sea. So when Matthew tells that story, they were not, un, they were not unfamiliar with the God who rebukes the sea. They heard it over and over and over again. I thought, they're asking the question, who is this man? And I wondered if that was not also the case with us sometimes. We sit in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and we ask the question, who is this man? He shows up, and we don't recognize him. We allow things that in the world, like the mire of the COVID, or whatever it might be, our difficulty, our jobs, our families, and he comes, and he wants to rebuke, and he wants to reveal to us, as it was true of the Passover, it is true in resurrection, it is true in his promises, it is true in the scriptures, that our God calms the wind and gives us peace in the midst of the storm. And he does it, and they say, who is this guy? And it's a challenge to all of us because sometimes we get so familiar we fail to recognize who he is. And Jesus said it well, right? A prophet is without honor in his own country. And the danger of being churchgoers, the danger of being followers of Christ, the danger of doing this week after week after week, it's so easily become ritualistic that when we're in the midst of a real season of difficulty, like COVID, we forget who he is, that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the one who rebukes the sea. He is the one that is not intimidated by disease or sickness or whatever might come our way. But I wonder if some of those things aren't just opportunities for us to recognize and be a little bit introspective to our own statements of failing to recognize who he is in the midst of this season in which we live. Even as Max just said it in the song that we sang, it is well with my soul. The song says, he calms the sea because it is a metaphor for what we go through and the reality is 
that he who took the full front of evil and went to the cross and died. And it wasn't the blood of a lamb, but it was the blood of the Son of God who was shed that we might have eternal life. And so when Paul says in Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? That maybe seasons like this are opportunities for us to live in the boldness and in the love and in the joy and in the confidence that our God is the king of the sea. But notice what goes on here, which is interesting, because they thought they were going to drown. And I wonder even in our culture today if we don't think at times like somebody else is in charge. And we enter into a fray that is not even our fight to, our, our fray to fight. Love is still stronger than death. And resurrection is meant the full blow of evil and came out victorious. And so in these seasons where confusion and slander and accusation and heartache come at us in such a way that we lose sight of who we are and who our God is, may we not be like the disciples and ask the question, who is this man? May we celebrate the one who rebukes the sea. Because notice what, what, what Matthew does here in this story. Because I think the sea is a little bit about what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4. He says to us, don't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes our way. But be a people who are rooted and grounded in the truth and in the power of a God who not only was raised from the dead, but has given each and every one of us new hearts and new opportunities through the new birth to live our life victoriously. But notice the contrast in this, in this next story that he tells. Verse 28. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. Notice what they say. What do you want with us, son of God? The disciples ask who is this guy? And the demons say, Son of God. It's a little strange, isn't it? That sometimes the demons know better about who he is than God's people. And the reality is that it goes on, have you come to torture us before the appointed time? So Matthew, in the story, instead of answering the question raised in verse 27, when the disciples say, who is this man? He tells us this other story about these demons in these two men who know who Jesus is immediately. And all of a sudden, this story begins to unfold and challenge the reader to come to our own conclusion. Who do men say that I am? Because at the end of the day, that's the only question that really merits an answer. And that might be the only question that God asks us. Who do you think this man is? Many of you maybe have come across the book Lord, Liar, or Lunatic, written by Josh McDowell a number of years ago, but that's the question. Who is he? Is he a liar? Is he a lunatic? Or is he the Lord of our life? The Lord of life and death. And so it goes on to say, what do you want with us, son of God, they shouted. And then all of a sudden, we recognize they already see their future. Because Jesus in Colossians chapter 2, it is said, openly disarmed the devil and his demons and openly and publicly made a display of them that all that they could throw at him could not contain him for he would by giving himself and making himself vulnerable would ultimately become victorious over sin and satan and all that the world and its brokenness had experienced and so the question for us i think is what do we do um with this story because Jesus is going about demonstrating his power over evil and 
over wickedness. And I'm challenged that maybe, you know, the, the Bible says in James chapter 2, uh, the devil, the demons, they believe, as we see in this story, and they tremble. And sometimes, maybe evil has a greater understanding of who Jesus is than God's people. And because when you go on to the, and read this story, we, we recognize that there is a sense that Matthew is telling us evil exists. And these are the words of Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 6, verse 12. He says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus is challenging us, even challenging us as the status quo, as Matthew is challenging us to recognize we don't wrestle only against flesh and blood. Paul knew that. Paul was beaten. Paul was in prison. Paul had all kinds of hardship, but he knew behind it all was something that we have seen to lose our awareness of. And it's called evil. Evil exists. Matthew tells us it exists. But the crazy thing about this story, when we read on, verse 30, some distance from them was a large herd of pigs that were feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. He said to them, go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Strange story. So those demons went from those two individuals into the pigs, and the demons threw the pigs into the water, and they died. And notice what happens is, those tending the pigs ran off and went into the town and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave the region. Never come back. The town wanted the demons more than they wanted Jesus. They wanted evil more than they wanted the one. They didn't think about the two men who were filled with these devils. They only thought about maybe their livelihood. And how he had, by delivering the men, sending the demons into the pigs, who sent the pigs over into the ocean, now was maybe getting in the way of their pocketbook. Is that not a strange story? That sometimes we want the pigs more than we want the Savior? And so when the reality of this story comes to us, it, it, it begins to teach us about this whole sense that Paul, and I want to read these verses because, well, let me read it again. Paul, chapter 6 of, of Ephesians, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the whole armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. We don't think about evil anymore. You know, when we think about the world in which we live, oh, a number of years ago, Dr. Carl Menninger wrote a book called Whatever Happened to Sin? It seems that sin in our culture, as evil in our culture, has taken on a new name. It's called psychological dysfunction or sociological oppression or a number of different words that are used in a sociological, psychological, pathological sense, but God help us, don't call it evil. But Paul himself says, we don't wrestle just against flesh and blood. Certainly there is flesh and blood that we wrestle against. 
but we've lived through the 20th century and had, did we ever see such a time of evil and heartache? Shall we not call the Holocaust evil? Shall we not call the cultural revolution where Chairman Mao killed 60 million people evil? Shall we not call abortion evil? Shall we not call racism evil? Evil is all around us. It's interesting that I, I read this book. It's called The Death of Satan. It's written by a guy that's not even a believer. And the first, the first part of the book, he says this. It's interesting in the introduction. I wanted to read it to you because I think he's onto something that maybe God's people sometimes lose sight of. He says this in the introduction. He says, a gulf has opened up in our culture between the visibility of evil and the intellectual resources available for coping with it. We think that we're going to overcome evil with societal norms or reform. We're going to deal with systemic issues and all of a sudden, without a transcendent value system, without a new birth of the heart, without dealing with the reality that only the gospel changes people, that we're somehow going to deal with all of the evil that exists by creating systems and structures and programs and laws to ultimately put evil away. It didn't happen in Germany. Mark, Mark said, you know, evil is the fact that the pro, proletariat was oppressed and therefore we need to set them free. And when the proletariat was set free, they became just as evil as their oppressor. Because evil exists. Evil can't be reduced to behaviorism. Evil can't be reduced to poverty. Evil can't be reduced to a lack of education. Evil can't be reduced to racism only in terms of the color of a person's skin. Evil is the result of Satan taking an ascendancy that didn't belong to him. And it exists today. And we in the West somehow have a problem with that. We, we make the devil into a caricature. We only know the devil if he pukes green stuff and turns his head in circles. Or, or it's a, a cartoon character with a tail and horns. But where did evil come from? And why do sometimes we wink at it, as the folks did, because it's getting in the way? We see white-collar crime. We see blue-collar crime. We see, we see all kinds of things going on. Remember, in the beginning... God created angels and he created humans. And one of those angels, Lucifer, that we call the devil, he said, I want my way. He sought his own ascendancy. He was the first one to say, I'm going to be like God without God. And in that, he was cast out. And the evil of that desire for ascendancy began to be put in motion. And it was that evil that came to human beings who said to Adam and Eve, you can be like God without God. And they bought into that program. And they too became evil. And evil became a part of humanity instigated by demons and taking all kinds of forms and shapes. Because what we end up doing is we rationalize it away in the name of things like virtue. And we say, I'm not greedy. I'm just thrifty. And we have all kinds of ways of rationalizing why we'd rather have the pigs. And so Matthew tells us his story. Because he wants us to come to an understanding not only in terms of the world that we live in, but the reality of what the restoration of the world will look like without evil. There was a movie that came out, I don't know how many years ago, called Silence of the Lambs. It was a story of a man by the name of Hannibal Lecter, right? And a 
detective for the FBI, Starling. And he comes to visit her. Uh, she comes to visit him in prison. He's behind this plexiglass. He's in this, in this straight jacket. He had killed a number of people and cannibalized them. And he hears her talking to some of the other sheriffs, and she begins to ask the question of, of the other law enforcement, what happened to him? What were his parents like? Was he abused? Where did he go wrong? And he overhears it. And this is his response to that. He says to her, nothing happened to me, Officer Starling. I happened. You can't reduce me to a set of influences. You've given up good and evil for behaviorism, Officer Starling. You've got everybody in moral dignity pants. Nothing is ever anybody's fault. Look at me, Officer Starling. Can you stand to say I'm evil? And church... The reality is evil, the reality of evil isn't simply in what people do. The reality of evil begins with how people think. And we live in a culture that holds to an ideology that God isn't the origin of life. That God isn't the one that provides meaning. That morality is not a transcendent value system given to us by God so that we would come to understand what is good and what is bad, but we create it through a relativism that says if it's good for you, okay, if it's good for me, well, you know, everybody has their own idea about truth. And so when we see it manifested politically, and when we see it manifested philosophically, it's not because people are simply evil, it's because people buy into ideologies with logical inconsistency that is nothing more than evil leading them down a path of destruction. And we're in these days. That's why Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly. They're mighty. They're to pull down strongholds. They're to fight against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we're to be a people who as followers of Christ understand the ideology in which we have called, if we say that we're followers of Christ, then what is the meaning of life? It's not about looking at a situation and then pointing fingers at people and then fighting that flesh and blood and fighting, because people are deceived. Who is the devil anyway? Diabolos. Right? And his name means slander, liar. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 4, the God of this world blinds the minds of those that don't believe, lest the light, the truth of Jesus, should be made known unto them. And so we recognize that the devil goes about and he does it with believers, right? He accuses us, he tempts us. And maybe those are his schemes that we read, the devil's schemes. Two of the greatest schemes are to deceive us by accusation and temptation. In accusation, we somehow place a high degree of understanding on God's holiness, but a really low understanding of His grace and His love. And therefore, we don't live up to the holiness, and so therefore, we find ourselves being accused even by our own self-talk. And we accuse ourselves of not being a good believer or a good Christian or a good person. And it begins to bring depression into our life. It begins to bring guilt and shame into our life. And we begin to be incapacitated by our guilt and shame because the devil is whispering into our ears, we're not good enough. And maybe that's true, but Jesus is way good enough. And while it is true that we are greater sinners than we ever want to admit, We are greater love than we could ever imagine. That's the gospel. So when the devil points at our sin, we point at our Savior. And we say, He has performed on my behalf. He is the King. 
of all of creation. But the devil comes and he wants to accuse us of not being good enough. You know, the should have, could have, would have. And if that doesn't work, then he comes to us and tempts us. And temptation is oftentimes the result of the imbalance of us really believing in God's love, but not so much in His truth or His holiness. And sometimes we think more highly of ourselves because of His love, and we end up thinking we can get away with things. And I know that's true because that had been my experience, thinking I was all that in a bag of chips. As a young pastor having a successful church, I knew He loved me but I sort of, sort of, what's the word, smudged on the holiness side. And the devil knows us, and he uses, he doesn't turn good people into bad people. He takes our flaws and twists them and uses them against us. And so when Matthew's telling us this story, he wants us to get an understanding here about Humanity without Christ. And why Paul would say, you know, every time I want to do good, I find evil present with me. The things that I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Only Jesus. And so when we talk about the kingdom, and we talk about the rewards of the kingdom, these stories are there for us to begin to understand how we might live in the truth of what the devil doesn't want us to understand, why he comes in accusation, why he comes in temptation, so that we end up being a people that are overwhelmed. Because who we fight against is, is the schemes of the devil. That's what we're fighting against, is his accusations, his temptations, his lies, his twisting of the truth. There's nothing more that he loves when he finds believers at odds with each other around issues like COVID. When God wants to use COVID to get us to press into him and to lean into him and love him and love each other in the midst of it because we're not Jesus. And we don't always have the right answers, but he does. And the one he gave us was not only to love our enemies, but love each other. And thus the world would know that we belong to him. I read these stories and I go, what? And yet I look more and look and more and look more at this story and, that story and I say, God, you're talking to me again. And so may we, I find when I read this book, I, I was amazed this guy's not a believer, yet he has a better understanding of evil than most followers of Christ. That's right, I'd say that too. The reality of it is that we have to press into Christ, his truth, and his grace. For grace and truth is what he came to deliver. And find that balance to live our lives in such a way that we ultimately become a people that live so that we don't fall prey to that. You know, it's interesting. If you go to other parts of the world, they don't have a problem with the devil or evil. But not Americans, we're way too sophisticated for that. And in our sophistication, we're as naive as it gets. Because we look out at the world. I was reading some stuff about the, the civil war in Yugoslavia when that took place and what they did to each other. And if you read that and you don't want to throw up, if you've never gone to the concentration camps, you step into Auschwitz and you smell and feel the presence of evil. And it's equally as true with six million babies being killed. And people are ignorant because the devil wants to keep people ignorant. And that doesn't mean that we go out and fighting against people. But we go out with an understanding that Christ would have us make a difference and that he would have us make a difference by making him King Jesus in our lives. And so as Matthew tells us the story, let us embrace it 
Let us put on the whole armor of God. Go back and read the rest of Ephesians chapter 6 and read what Paul asks us to put on to combat the schemes of the devil. And put it on. And know that we're engaged in an ideological battle. Know that there's a battle for the lives, for the souls of men and women in our country. And then pray. Pray like you never did before. And rise up from your prayer with the belief that our, our King Jesus, He rules and reigns in our world. Amen? Let's pray.